Horseki no Kuni, or Land of the Lustrious, is a show about anime geology. They use obsidian swords to protect their socialist commune in a fight against moon-based capitalists, who desire to turn them into Gucci dog collars to then sell on the open market. In a world where hot pants have become standard battle attire, we follow the trials and tribulations of newly formed Phosphophyllite in their quest to find a place within the utopian commune of unreasonably attractive genderless rocks. Where an unfortunate lack of talent, skills, general motivation, and a particularly high market value has kept them in a minor rut for the last 300 years. Now, this purposely obtuse sentence might not inspire a lot of confidence. However, trust me, much like the man offering free candy in front of your elementary school, I can always be relied upon to deliver a satisfactory product. Brought forth from the mind of Haruko Ichikawa, who I can only assume to be an out-of-work geologist who did PCP one weekend while locked inside a Greek exhibition, the anime and manga chronicle the lives of non-human mineral-based sentients who hit every strike zone except those relating to breast size. No boobs. Confused? Here, I'll dumb it down a bit. Just imagine your pet rock from when you were four. Now make it hot. For those of you still lost, just know this story is actually a mystery among other things. One that slowly unfolds for maximum effect. Much like the lies I told in fifth grade about my girlfriend who went to another school. They are real to me! As such, consider this a spoiler-free review. The manga, which started in 2012, received an anime adaption in 2017, hotly anticipated to be a massive flop by those of us who had a cursory look and saw the word CGI. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Myself being a brainlet who can't discern quality, picked up Hoseki by chance, and after the first episode, instantly knew I'd struck an alloy of platinum and gold. Foss, who is technically a MILF at 300, is only one of many characters we get to know throughout, who I shall summarise in this detailed character sheet. We'll get to know their personalities, quirks, and of course, the immutable facts of rock-based classism. Foss, however, is undeniably our main character. One that prefers rolling around on the floor daydreaming about being a hero amidst a terrorist attack rather than actually training for enlistment. So, literally me. Foss inhabits the lower stratum of the shiny rock slash magpie fearing society, being one of the weakest at three and a half hardness and youngest. Though saying society is a bit of a stretch if I'm honest, at 28 it's more of an extended family. The rocks using honorifics referring to each other as siblings, such as older or younger brother. Brother, I am pinned here! Now, before we continue, there is one thing I must address. Regarding the character designs, you've probably noticed their aesthetically pleasing aspects. And put bluntly, I really want to fuck. <laughs> Let's start by pointing out the most objectively wild thing. Functional, not vomit-inducing CGI characters. From their hair to their legs, the creators of Hoseki went all in on character CGI, an action that usually results from a board meeting where terms like we're broke or they'll buy it anyway come up in quick succession. And yet, this show has some of the most unique and downright gorgeous character designs of the past decade, an achievement that cannot be understated in a world where modern Berserk adaptions look cut straight from a 90s adventure game. CGI is often used as a tool to make action cheaper in anime. Gundam use it for their missile spam, Slice of Life use it for distant crowd shots, and animation directors use it for their PowerPoint presentations when they'd rather embezzle the budget. So when I say this blew everyone away, I mean it. It was like opening a box labelled dead puppies only to find the puppy alive and willing to aid in tax evasion. Before Hoseki, the idea of beautiful CGI was at best a joke, at worst a self-delusion for strung out animators. From running through open land to flips and twirls amidst the heat of battle, it's damn near impossible to look away. I had that shit on repeat after every episode like a divorced father re-watching birthday videos from when his daughter actually returned his calls. The innovation was to the point where I immediately imagined fantastical future where all CGI anime embraced this methodology, like some kind of utopia for weebs. However, as you all know, hope is the first step on the road to disappointment. But more than having simply the right tech, which blended traditional animation and CGI, Hoseki leads your focus excellently. Framing, shot composition, the director went wild. Making sure that every scene your eyes were drawn to the right place at the right time, because the CGI does have its issues like any other, but you just don't notice them. You're too distracted by Daya to really care, or alternatively Shinsha, sitting alone in the dark of a cave, consumed by insecurity and fear. Did I not mention this show is somewhat heartbreaking? Speaking of falling apart, however, 
ASMR Crystal Shattering is now on my repeat playlist, along with much of the soundtrack in fact. So let's talk about that. It's no secret I'm a massive simp for a good OST. Music elevates scenes, much like my heart rate whenever Dyer is on screen. Oh my god. But let's go straight for the jugular here. Orchestral soundtracks are top tier. I fell so deeply in love with the shrine bells and drums of the Lunarian theme that I use it for D&D. Please god don't reveal to my normie players I lift all my music from anime. The theme is wonderfully complex and creepy in a way. Clearly someone was told to imagine the sound a Hindu god would make as it descends to earth with the intent to fuck shit up. All I know is that when the whining instrument that I cannot for the life of me imagine is anything but a goddamn kazoo starts, I get high. It's a wonderfully creative form of battle music that plays no small part in building up the threat of the Lunarians, while simultaneously spotlighting the mystery of their existence and true intentions. Hoseki might not be a particularly happy show. But you'd be forgiven for thinking otherwise. With the amount of arse wiggling rock clips I have and the entirety of Foss's existence as a walking avatar of the comedic gods, at least at first. So believe me when I say, Hoseki's music can turn on a dime. From upbeat and playful, to regretful and somber. Suffering is a defining characteristic of many of its tracks, one naturally mirrored by the story. Shincha exists to remind us that problems introduced and solved in the same episode aren't real problems, even if in our heart we wish it were so easy. Things beyond our control define us, like gravity we can only adapt. And Shinsha, whose main element is inherently toxic mercury, has adapted best they can. Their very existence is harmful to all life, including that of their siblings. Shinsha holds others at arm's length, but the mask of disinterest and hostility has long since degraded, and what's left is someone desperate to be noticed, to be needed, waiting for someone to save them. Thematically, Hoseki demonstrates the unfairness of life, and certainty of change, even for those considered immortal. Least, one happy thing I can report about Hoseki is that it has a truly unique fantasy setting. At no point does a Japanese high school boy appear fresh from a three car pileup, ready to amaze the world with his simple soy sauce recipe, like it's fucking blue meth. We have to cook. Unlike more predictable fantasy, Hoseki is rather layered and complex. It doesn't rely on easy Tolkienian crutches where the hound why reduced to culturally salient information about goblins and a 20 second info dump about a plug and play magic system. At the start of our story, Foss is given a simple job, make an encyclopedia. They royally screw it up. I cannot understate how lovably inept Foss is, yet determined to push forward in their own way, even against multiple setbacks. Like a dog proclaimed mayor of Los Angeles, sure, she won't be very effective in reducing the murder rate, but my God, the billboards will look good. Mystery is the name of the game in Hoseki, though certainly not the only story mechanic at work. Questions like, who the hell is Sensei? How did these arse rocks come to be? What even are these goddamn Lunarians? Will Dyer ever respond to my DMs? Some mysteries remain unknowable. Now, their commune leader Sensei is actually rather interesting, as the only character with identifiably male characteristics on an island populated entirely by twinks and tomboys. Schrodinger's hot pants do be making me think. Now, while this might sound like the start of a Manson esque cult story of a lone man with an army of fanatically loyal femboys, the reality is Sensei is more the benevolent father figure than anything more Habsburgian. The rocks more or less love and respect him. Foss does too, whose more direct statement on the matter warms my heart. But, cuteness aside, the long and short of the anime can be summarised as overflowing with mystery, driven forward by wonderful character drama. On a more technical point, the manga for Hoseki is unfinished, which might be a deal breaker for some. Yet, at over 90 chapters long, it's a fair way in, and by all accounts considered close to the end, with the anime only adapting up to chapter 31. I'd temper any hopes of a sequel however, not on the basis of any concrete knowledge, just the fact that God hates anime. So here we are with the final question. Should you dive headfirst into this sea of hot pants, mystery, and CGI geodes? Well, yes. It might not appeal to those that feel comfortable neck deep in the familiar and predictable, but I have no doubt the characters alone will pull people in, if given the chance. For the casual or junkie, Hoseki is a well spent four hours. In my case, the anime has spent years swimming through my thoughts on and off. I can't seem to stop. Stop it. It's like telling someone to not think about a pink elephant, except it's an animated rock in booty shorts. Unlike many stories, 
Hoseki doesn't pretend that everything is predetermined to work out, that simply trying your best, having courage, will be enough. But neither does it begrudge effort, it only asks what we lose in return. Innocence, ignorance, and more. It is not improvement that is guaranteed with each step, only change. Be it through the pained cries of self-loathing or constant failure, Hoseki is asking a simple question. How far are you willing to go? What will you sacrifice to get there? And at the end, when everything is said and done, what will you have left? Me too, Foss. Me too. That took longer than I anticipated. Smash like and subscribe to support my financially inadvisable decision to buy mineral-specific handcrafted figures for each of the characters. A few of you also wanted specific references, so I thought I'd slap down a list here in the credits instead of the entire script of Morbius. Now, onto the comments. Don't know if I'm the only one, but your sound effects and music seem louder than your voice. Yeah, I feel audio balance is my next big target to wrestle with. Do let me know how this one turns out. Entertaining and spoiler free. Thanks. I'm considering adding a spoiler section in the future, but I do want people to watch these shows, so I'll weigh my options. You really didn't need to mention Nikocado Avocado's colon. I disagree. Alright, tune in next time for part one of my series focusing on cat girls in anime, and what their existence in turn means for the specifics of in-universe Dim Sim production.